By following along with this second half, you'll learn about the specific electrical and physical characteristics of electric motors. Once again, Daryl Robertson joins us to provide more in-depth explanations of many of these topics. By following along with this second half, you'll learn about the basic characteristics of electric motors, including voltage, horsepower, RPM, temperature, capacitors, speeds, rotation, shaft types, and mounting options. This section discusses the voltage ratings of electric motors. Another characteristic is voltage. Motors must work within plus or minus 10% of the nameplate voltage. An example would be a 115 volt motor can work up to 126.5 volts and down to 103.5 volts. This does not mean, however, you want to run a 115 volt motor at 103 volts constantly. This will cause damage to the motor. But on short times, the motor will work up and down with that fluctuation. If we measure line voltage in any given socket during the day, that voltage will fluctuate up and down based on usage in an area. Thus, motors must work within this fluctuation. The other thing that's commonly mistaken in voltage is the differences in voltage between a 208-230 versus a 208-230 motor. A 208-230 motor is actually a dual voltage motor. It has two separate electrical connections and is either 208 volt and must be reconnected for 230. The other type is a 208-230 motor. This motor has one electrical connection and will work with that entire range 208 through 230 plus or minus 10 percent on one electrical connection. Another common mistake is when you see a motor that is 115 slash 230 volt versus 230 volt slash 115. These motors are how they are preset from the factory. The first voltage is how we build it when it leaves the facility. So a 115 slash 230 volt is pre-wired and preset for 115 volts, must be reconnected for 230. A 230 slash 115 volt motor is preset 230 volt and must be reconnected for 115. It is always best to verify the nameplate voltage before hooking a motor up. This section addresses horsepower and service factors for both fractional horsepower motors and for NEMA certified motors. One of my favorite subjects is horsepower, another characteristic of electric motors. There is a true calculation for horsepower, and it is horsepower equals pound-feet of torque times revolutions per minute divided by 5250. That is a set standard. Another known standard is a calculation that 746 watts equals one horsepower. The issue with this lies in the industry itself. Original equipment manufacturers and others on fractional horsepower motors, which again are 56 frame and smaller, they don't really use this calculation. So in most cases, horsepower is not quite a true reflection of what it is on the plate. A one-third horse may not necessarily be a one-third horse motor. In fractional horsepower motors, we use full load amps to identify the amount of work the motor does, and in fractional motors, we use full load amps to match the replacement motor. Contrary the IHP or integral motors, 143 T-frame and larger, are so regulated by NEMA that true horsepower calculation is used. Thus, a 143 T-frame that is a two-horse motor is truly a two-horsepower motor. Another factor you have to consider when talking horsepower is service factor. By definition, service factor is a multiplier which when applied to the horsepower indicates the total horsepower load the motor can carry at a rated voltage and frequency. In some applications, the service factor represents a safety factor or what the motor will work up to for a short amount of time. Most integral horsepower or IHP motors have a service factor of 1.15. When you match horsepower and service factor of a replacement motor to the original, you must match both the horsepower and service factor. Most fractional horsepower motors 56 frame and smaller, have a 1.0 service factor or no service factor listed at all. In addition, some original equipment motors don't have a horsepower on the nameplate, or again, the horsepower may be completely misleading. Thus, when we're matching these motors for horsepower again, we look at full load amps. This section discusses RPM.
how to calculate RPM, and how this rate varies based on the number of poles in the motor. Another characteristic of motors is RPM, or revolutions per minute. There is a formula for revolutions per minute, and it's 60 hertz times 60 seconds times two polarity changes, so a constant of 7,200 polarity changes per minute in a motor. When we build electric motors, we build them in two, four, six, and eight pole configurations. The formula is 7200 divided by the number of poles equals synchronous RPM. So in the case we have here, we look at the number of poles, each distinct coil is a pole. We have one, two, three, four, five, and six poles. So 7200 divided by six equals 1200 synchronous RPM. Because this is a magnet pulling on the rotor, there is some slip or loss. So we rate general purpose motors based on that slip. A six pole motor, 1200 synchronous, would be rated 1075 or 1050 RPM. This section addresses the relationship between a motor's temperature and its longevity. Another characteristic of motors is temperature. The temperature capabilities of each insulation class are defined as being the maximum temperature at which the insulation can be operated before a thermally protected motor will trip on the overload. NEMA sets insulation classes. Class A is 105 degrees C or 221 degree Fahrenheit. Class B is 130 degrees centigrade or 266 degrees Fahrenheit. Class F is 155 degrees C or 311 degrees Fahrenheit. A class H motor is 180 degrees C or 356 degrees Fahrenheit. These are the temperatures the motor will work up to before the overload trips. However, we would not want to see a motor operating at full temperature all the time. There are different types of overload protectors that are inside different motors. There's an automatic thermal overload that this motor, when it reaches a certain temperature in the overload trips, it will automatically restart when the overload cools down. In applications where we don't want the motor to start right back up, there is a manual overload, and this overload you have to manually reset before the motor will restart. There are some applications that are in hot environments where there is no overload in the motor. And there's another application where we have an overload that's called a one-shot. Once the motor trips on the overload, it's basically a disposable motor. Shown here are examples of overload protection devices. Another characteristic to consider is a motor's capacitor. This section discusses how to properly size a capacitor for a motor. Another characteristic of motors are capacitors, or those that use capacitors. There are start capacitors, run capacitors, dual capacitors, there are even multi-rated capacitors. And here again in capacitors, there is a 10% rule on microfarads, however, it only really applies to those motors that have very high microfarad ratings. It's very unlikely to find a 5 microfarad or 5.5 microfarad capacitor. One of the main rules of capacitors is, it doesn't matter what your old motor had, you always as cheap insurance, replace the capacitor when buying a new motor and match the capacitor to the new motor. Another factor is you can always go up in voltage, not down. An example would be a 5 microfarad 370 volt can be replaced with a 5 microfarad 440 volt capacitor. The microfarads remain the same, but the voltage can go up. You would never, though, want to replace a 5 440 with a 5 370. This section focuses on multi-speed motors. The horsepower of a motor is determined by its winding and electrical design, but its actual RPM is determined by the motor's load. Follow along with this section to learn more. Another characteristic are multi-speed motors, or multi-speed tap. A typical three-speed motor has high, medium, and low-speed taps. Those taps go through more internal wire in the motor, thus creating resistance. The high speed tap goes through the shortest amount of coil. Medium goes through additional coil, creating resistance, which weakens the magnet. The low speed tap goes through even more coil, weakening the magnet further, thus slowing the motor down.
Because of a, the number of poles determines the RPM, a six pole motor still wants to turn 1200 RPM. But as we go through each successive speed tap, the load helps determine the actual RPM the motor will run at. A typical multi-speed PSC half or six pole motor with no load on high, medium and low illustrates that with no load would be 1200 synchronous RPM on all three speed taps because there is no load against the motor, the number of poles is determining the RPM. If we put that half horse motor under a half horsepower load, note now that it slows down on high to 1075, which would be rated with slip, on medium speed slows down to about 1000 RPM, and low speeds about 900 RPM. If we take that exact same motor, however, and put it under a third horsepower load, notice that high now speeds up to about 1100 RPM, and medium becomes 1075, and low is now 1000 RPM. Thus again, the load helps determine what actual RPM this motor will run at on the different speed taps available. The rotation of the motor varies with the motor's application. Another characteristic of motors we talk about is rotation. There is no NEMA standard on whether a motor is clockwise, counterclockwise. It's based upon what end of the motor you're looking at, whether it's lead end or shaft end. If you're looking at a motor on the shaft end and it's clockwise, that would be counterclockwise on the lead end. Because there is no industry standard, we typically use the blade or wheel or the driven object to determine the rotation. In addition, some shaded pole motors are mechanically reversible, which means we can take the motor apart, put it back together with a shaft out the opposite end, and reverse it. But it physically must be put back together to reverse the rotation. All three-phase motors are reversible and most general purpose motors that are provided have an electrically reversible connection allowing them to be very versatile. With so many ways to describe rotation in the industry, be sure to record the load rotation when removing a motor from an application. Refer to the chart here to see common rotation types and their standard abbreviations. A motor's shaft length and diameter will also vary with the motor's application. Another characteristic is the shaft of the motor. There are set NEMA diameters, 42 frame through integral horsepower. However, when we talk about fractional motors, there is no NEMA set length of shaft. So 56 frame and smaller do not have a length designation, but may have a diameter designation. Integral horsepower motors, or 143T frame and above, are heavily regulated. The shaft length, the shaft keyway, is all a set standard. If a motor deviates from the NEMA standard, those motors have a designated Z suffix after the frame size. So a motor that is a 143TZ would have a motor with a non-NEMA standard shaft. Refer to the chart here to see shaft diameters for various motors. This section addresses the various mounting options for motors. The last characteristic we'll talk about is the mounting. The NEMA standard for mounting on a motor is a motor with a welded, rigid base. Unfortunately, in the HVACR industry, most motors don't have a welded, rigid base. NEMA did help us because non-NEMA standard mount motors have the frame letter Y suffix. This tells us that that motor is a non-NEMA standard mount. There are other frame suffixes that help us also identify what type of mounting is there. A C is a C-faced mount motor. An H, the two-foot hole or base hole dimension is greater than standard, most commonly a 56 frame motor. J is a C-faced motor with a threaded shaft. M and N are oil burner motors. S is a short shaft typically applied to the IHP motors. JM, JP, and TCZ are closed couple pump motors. And again, the letter Y is a special mount. It just means it's a deviation from NEMA standard, so it doesn't have a welded rigid base. And Z is a non-standard shaft. There are numerous mounting kits that are available to help match some of the non-standard mounting configurations in the OEM market. These can be added to a general purpose motor to help fit those applications. You learned about the specific characteristics of motors including voltage, horsepower, RPM, temperature, capacitors, speeds, 
rotation, and mounting types.